Thank you, Jerry. Um, okay, uh, just thanks again to um, Chris and congratulations to all of Ruth and their celebrations this year. Um, I am um, going on a wing of prayer here with regards to this uh, presentation software. It's all up there in the cloud somewhere. But it's called Prezi and um, hopefully it, 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 it will do me right. Um, regional competitiveness in a smart economy. This is kind of a, uh, a topic that really crosses two of my, my primary research uh, areas. And um, as such, I mean, it's kind of a concept that I'm struggling with, that you might see, um, and, and trying to develop. Um, I mean, competitiveness uh, and, 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 uh, and my focus in terms of looking at competitiveness has kind of grown out of, um, I suppose, really looking at industrial policy documents across a number of countries, uh, especially European countries, and comparing and seeing what it is that they're, they're talking about um, when they're talking about the ability to compete internationally. And, you know, there's kind of a very generic type of... Um, uh, definition that, that we get competitiveness, and that's the comparative concept of the ability of performance for some sector or country to sell and supply goods and our services in any given market. And a couple of particular elements to, to, to competitiveness, and that is of course that it's dynamic, um, in constant flux, and, and something that's, that's relative. But throughout it all, uh, most of these documents and and the plethora of indices that have, that have started to come out in the last 10 or so years do try and quantify uh, this, 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 this pain that, that is competitiveness. And that's really kind of the focus of what I want to talk about today. Um, uh, in in, in me, you know, it is that compelling concept. It is the kind of things that the newspapers will pick up on. It's the kind of things that everybody who reacts to view, view a share, like a shareholder or, or, or an investor, or indeed policymakers, it's a very simplistic and compelling argument to make that this place or this firm is more competitive than that firm, and therefore you can draw your own conclusions on it. Um, so, uh, it's relative, uh, uh, you know, the relative nature of it makes it, you know, possible to situate firms and spatialities, either countries or regions, in particular places. The idea, of course, comes kind of out of the business literature and, and uh, really um, you can go back anywhere to, to the Penrose. You know, I know Dieter mentioned uh, uh, in his terms of uh, looking at the evolution of thought uh, in terms of endogenous growth theories, mentioned quite a few of, of, of the theorists there. But, um, you know, it's kind of a very simplistic idea as well in terms of the competitive advantage of the firm lies in its stock of assets, and there are particular assets. And there's the idea of monotonicity that the more of these assets that you have, the more competitive that you become. But of course, the key notion is that it's the rarity of these assets that guarantee your competitiveness over sustainable uh, future. So, again, uh, I'm simplicity here, but you know, you have your very basic physical assets that that are kind of the low value added and, um, uh, and, and, and higher value added assets on top of that. And the top of these, you know, we have the brand and the reputation and the social capital and these kind of untraded interdependencies that we mentioned this morning. And I suppose the key differentiation is, is, is those which are replicable and those which are non-replicable. And we can all think of, and indeed, um, Phil Cook's um, presentation, uh, 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 went into more detail than I need to go to on this, of, of products that are, that are out there with replicable and non-replicable elements. So what's the difference between a Zen Creative or any other MP3 player and, and the Apple iPod? Well, in our, in, I make the argument here that it's the non-replicability of the kind of ephemeral elements of, 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 of an Apple iPod, be it the brand or be it supporting infrastructure in terms of iTunes, uh, it, it's a sign of agreement with, with, a, with a number of, 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 of music companies and music distributors that will basically see this company kind of offer an experiential um, um, an experiential type of experience uh, uh, with, with, with their products. 
So when we take this and, and uh, as many have, to kind of roll this kind of same logic across the territorial competitiveness, and taking it out of the, the firm and applying it to, to spatialities. So you see you have different regions with different elements from, uh, I, I'm just making you know, the interviews here of the present if you don't mind, uh, uh, with different elements to their regions. And you know, we look at that and we see that there are replicable elements and there are non-replicable elements to, um, to spatialities. Um, and, and much of this is, I suppose, where I kind of really get to focus in terms of looking at the industrial, different industrial policies uh, across Europe, that uh, um, much of these smart economy documents will constantly refer to and highlight their regions, in, uh, the importance to their regions of relatively replicable elements and spend very little time talking about the non-replicable elements. Um, and so when it comes to these competitive indices, you're constantly, we, we get this barrage then of these statistics. So what we're out there trying to do is quantify this element. And it can be anything from GDP to percentage of third level education and they're uh, 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 and we try to bring them all together to add them up in, into this competitive index. So this kind of comes out. This uh, index itself is from the fifth report in on European economic and social regions. And uh, you'll see the regions um, given their relative ranking. But I think where this is interesting is where we take I suppose definitions like that of Michael Storfer in 1997 and look at it in terms of how I've tried to look at it now and will do over the rest of this paper, in terms of regions' ability to compete for foreign direct investment. Um, so in a kind of broader context of, of, a, of a Eurozone economy that uh, this, is, uh, um, this is employment and uh, unemployment that, that was suffered as a result of, of, of the kind of crash of 2008 and the credit crisis, this is, a map, uh, this is a graph from the European Restructuring Monitor that uh, basically shows where employment is beginning to grow. Okay? You know, we have suffered massive um, structural adjustments with regard to uh, the economy and the industries in the economy. But there are certain industries within the economy that continue to grow. And many of these we've already referred to um, this morning. They are the high value added. They are the companies that are better defined by the non-replicable assets than than the replicable So I want to look at the 130th most competitive uh, region in, in, uh, in Europe uh, out of the 260. Now there's two regions. And this is the um, border Midlands and Western region. And looking at uh, company restructurings over the past 18 months, and it's been a top 18 months for a nation and a region, uh, of course, IMF bailout, and one of the things that, that has marked it. And these ebbs and flows in the jobs front, as so this has already been mentioned, Bill mentioned the IDA figures um, uh, that, that, that were coming out uh, earlier on this year. They were pretty positive in terms of um, IDAs. I think it was probably one of its most successful years in, in the last five or so years for, for job notes. And, um, what I, the, the data I'm using here is from the European Restructuring Monitor that looks at restructurings, that is, uh, companies um, either closing or, start, or, or adding uh, uh, certain agreements of, of more than 100 persons. Um, and have seen that basically, even at, at a national level for Ireland and, and, and at the regional level for the border, Mid Midlands and Western, the positive has, has outweighed the negative. What I did then was just a very quick and dirty categorization of these jobs along the value added, from really low value added uh, manufacturing and services to higher value added manufacturing and services to the high end agreements of R&D. And we see something that I, I suppose is kind of misconstrued in terms of really the jobs that have been lost um, over the past 18 months in the main have been low value added jobs. For, 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 for Ireland as a nation, there has been um, lots of low value uh, added services, and we can recognise that through the likes of companies like Talk Talk, um, up in the leading and out Waterford. Um, for the border, middle, and western, it, it was more low value manufacturing that was with 
the uh, restructuring of a number of uh, medical device companies in the Midlands in particular. But in terms of job gain, then it's virtually uh, you know, uh, a turnaround, a flip around, where we're, we're gaining is in the higher value add R&D agreements, um, and much, much less so in terms of, of the lower value added manufacturing incidences. This is interesting, I suppose, the fact that if there's anything in terms of the jobs lost, it's a fairly straight split between foreign-owned and, and Irish-owned companies, but in terms of job gains, it's predominantly foreign-owned companies that have been creating the most employment in Ireland for the last uh, 18 months. Looking at uh, Goa City um, in particular, I mean, there are lots of different facets that, that describe it, but you know, <coughs> um, many people in Goa will constantly refer to the likes of the medical device cluster that has grown um, around the city primarily since the closure or the restructuring of digital back in the early 90s. But there's a healthy ICT sector there, there's a healthy creative sector there, significant and growing gaming sector. Um, and um, a, a, a city that has uh, very much adapted and um, promoted its label of culturally uh, of, of cultural capital and as an attractive place. And so that's kind of what brings me to this element of, of, of competitiveness. <coughs> what I have um, seen again and again, and this is through interviews with people in uh, FDI, is that when we talk to them about why it is that they have come to a region like the border of Middle and Western region, which is, again, the 130th most competitive region in Europe, um, they begin to say very different things to that which you see in the policy documents. So, I mean, to take a particular example, two uh, gaming, international gaming company, EA Games and Zenimax, that, that came to go away in, um, in the last 18 months. What they're saying is, you know, they're, they're citing very kind of soft factors, not, none of these factors that, that really, uh, that, that you see as part of, of competitive indices that they're talking about the excitement, they're talking about cultural facilities, they're talking about the attractiveness of, of these places, uh, or in particular, uh, uh, Galway as a place. So in essence, what it comes down to, and I think this is where I really want to kind of take the work in terms of it as a starting point, is this word cloud, which I've um, used for um, uh, industrial policy documents and uh, interviews uh, uh, with foreign direct investors that are located in Ireland and questions with regard to why it is they have located it. Tax doesn't figure as uh, significantly there because I, I, I had a separate question on tax, but in essence the point is that there's a very different language, very different rhetoric being used by people for why it is they're coming here um, as opposed to the policy documents and the states that are out there trying to predict why it is they should come. 